So let's look at, I will get to all your Super Chat questions, I promise, later. And as much as I want to jump in right now with answers to some of them, I will get to them uh, later. So let's look at this video. I've got it up. It's by Act.TV. I have no idea who Act.TV is. I, it, it seems pretty benign, pretty, pretty lame, pretty, uh, not la lame, lame's probably not the right word, but pretty naive and, you know, it's, it's pretty standard. This is not an academically sophisticated attempt to define, um, to define, uh, you know, systemic racism. Th thank you, Ratti8989. That was very generous, uh, very generous super chat. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you're going to get me in trouble with that question. All right. Um, so, act.tv. So, let's just view it, and I will do as I always do. I will stop it in the middle and, uh, and talk about it and uh, review it. And uh, we will see whether there is such a thing as systemic racism. And uh, based on how at least ACTV defines it, I'm sure there can be other definitions out there. All right, ready? Here we go. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor neighborhood. He has a friend named Kevin who lives in a wealthy neighborhood. All of Jamal's neighbors are African American and all of Kevin's neighbors are white. Because Jamal's school district is mostly funded by property taxes, his school is not very well funded. His classrooms are overcrowded, his teachers are underpaid, and he doesn't have access to high-quality tutors or extracurricular activities. Now let's stop right there. Because while there are parts of the country in which this is very true, that school is all funded by um, property taxes. And, and by the way, the one area where I think I, I agree most with the idea of systemic racism or or the evil, the, 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 the consequences are to destroy uh, certain communities is on the issue of education, but not in the way that they're presenting it here. So it's true that, that property taxes are what fund the school. Property taxes are low because the areas in which these schools exist are poor, and therefore the quality, what the argument is, that the quality of the education is poor. Now there's a lot to say about this, but let's start with the fact that there are many states in America today that do not fund their schools exclusively from, pri from uh, property taxes. For example, in California, I think it's unconstitutional because the, the Supreme Court in California recognized the fact that some schools were getting a little bit of money, some schools were getting a lot of money, and that those were huge disparities in, edu in public education, government education. And therefore, what it has done is, it, is demand that the state supplement the school budget beyond the property taxes to equate the amount of money going into the various schools. Has this dramatically improved the quality of education in minority schools? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. So maybe it's something else. So maybe we should start thinking about public schools, government schools. I need to train myself to call them government schools because they're government schools. Maybe the problem here is that we don't have markets in education. Maybe the problem is here is that the schools are run by government bureaucrats with curriculum set by government bureaucrats, set by departments of education at universities that are pff, breeding grounds for you know, unrealistic and, and detached from reality means of supposedly educating kids from new math to sight see reading to a variety of different ways. Why don't we blame where the blame really lies, and that is with the quality of education that's being received here. And the quality of education that's being received here has nothing to do with budget. I've given this example many times, but I'll give it again. In the inner city of Chicago, now these are numbers that are probably four or five years old, so forgive me for being out of date a little bit. But four or five years ago, in the city, in the inner city of Chicago, it cost the city of Chicago fifteen thousand dollars a child to provide an education in the government schools. Fifteen thousand dollars a child. In Utah, for example, it cost four thousand dollars a child. In other places, it cost somewhere between four to ten. Fifteen thousand dollars a child should buy you a fantastic education. 
But it doesn't. We know that the inner cities of Chicago, education sucks is a nice word of describing it. It is horrific. It is awful. The kids there, many of them are bored. You know, don't, the baddest kids don't even finish school. Um, and and they, they don't go to college. And uh, the education, they don't know anything when they come out of school. In the same neighborhoods, across the street. So it's not an issue of the culture of the neighborhood. You have Catholic schools. I'm no big fan of Catholic schools. I'm not a fan of religion, period. But you have Catholic schools. They charge 7,500 a kid, or cost them 7,500 a child to educate the child, children. Half of what it costs the city of Chicago. And yet the quality of education is significantly better. Significantly better. The city of Chicago could, for all intents and purposes, Stop, shut down every single school it has. Privatize the system, subsidize it at the rate of $7,500 a child. Return the rest of the money to the taxpayers. And the children would get a superior, a dramatically superior education. So don't tell me it's money. Because in many places it is not. Now I'm sure there are school districts that are stopped for funds. I'm sure that there's school districts that get very little money, and I'm sure in some places that is a factor. But the problem is much more fundamental. It's not about money. It's about the fact that these are government schools. It's a fact that these are government schools. Now, I interviewed on the show a few weeks ago uh, James Tooley, who wrote a, a, a brilliant book called The Beautiful Tree. A Beautiful Tree documents the existence of private schools in the worst slums in the world, in Calcutta and in, in, uh, in Nigeria and much of Africa and all over India. And these schools are just as good, if not much better, usually much better, than the government schools. And as he said on the show with me, they would be even better if they didn't teach the government curriculum if they could actually have competition on curriculum. So the solution to the problem of education in America, the solution to the education of, of minority kids, the solution to education broadly is privatizing the schools. It's, it's education saving accounts if we can't go full out privatization because, you know, because you have to transition there. And a lot of these families, the argument goes, can't afford private education, again, the work of James Tooley shows that they can afford private education. The private education schools would not have big gyms, swimming pools, tennis courts, football fields. My guess is many of these inner city schools don't have that anyway. And you don't need that to provide a great education. As Marva Collins, a private school teacher who taught in the inner city of Chicago, and every one of her kids went to college. And it was a cheap school, and parents paid for it. So there's no reason poor people, particularly if you take off some of the burdens, tax burdens, other burdens like licensing laws and everything else, minimum wage, all the burdens that poor people have to face, if you take those burdens away from them that the state places on them, can't afford a private education. So the problem of different quality educations, which is real, is solved by privatizing the educational system. And the best way to do that, that I know of, as a first step, is education saving accounts. You can look up education saving accounts. And that would solve the problem. That would get rid of this. And I wonder how many of the people who are pushing this idea of systemic Racism that originates in the school system. How many of them are pushing education saving incomes? By the way, I'm against vouchers. The solution is education saving incomes. Vouchers allow the government to define who, you, who gets a voucher. And then it puts standards on schools to get the voucher. And education saving accounts put the money, puts the money in the parent's bank account for use on any education, homeschooling, online education, evening education, any form of education. 
You want to give parents real choice. Not parents, the choice is selected for them by government. So I would move away from vouchers to use tax credits or tax saving plans, tax saving accounts, which the, which the government funds. So we fund schools that the teachers choose. That is the solution to the one issue where there's real truth, there's real discrimination. All right, let's keep going. school district is also funded by property taxes. So his school is very well funded. His classrooms are never crowded, his teachers are very well paid, and he has access to high quality tutors and lots of extracurricular activities. And what's amazing about that is yes, they have a lot of money. And education sucks. And education is horrible. And again, and, and by international standards, education is terrible. And again, even for the Rich kid, the solution is to privatize the schools. The solution is competition. The solution is innovation, not more government schools. Kevin and Jamal live only a few streets away from each other. So how come they're growing up in such different worlds with such different opportunities for success? The answer has to do with America's history of systemic racism. To understand it better, let's look at what life was like for Kevin and Jamal. Now, no history of systemic racism. Now, when you talk about history, there clearly was systemic racism in history, and we'll get to that now. This is the grandparents. Decades after the Civil War, many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable desirable for investment. This practice was called redlining, and it usually blocked off entire black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Now this is absolutely true. And this is part of the disgraceful history of this country. It really is. Even in the North, across the entire United States, um, starting for example, starting really with the, with the, with the, uh, with the New Deal, FDR's New Deal. Uh, redlining did not happen, not in this sense, not in the sense I'm going to talk about to white neighborhoods. There's a sense in which it happened in white neighborhoods, but not the sense I'm going to talk about. Not in the sense of denying loans, even before the denying of loans. The fact is that post-World War I, World War II, um, you remember that in the New Deal, the government created a bunch, the, the, the FDR administration created a bunch of regulatory agencies, the, a bunch of government agencies, whose job was to provide housing for Americans. These agencies built affordable housing. These agencies insured mortgages. These agencies secured financing for various real estate projects. These were government agencies, created again during the New Deal during the 1930s. And after World War II, these agencies became significantly engaged in helping Americans, particularly Americans coming back from war with very little young, young people, young men coming back, establishing families, wanting to buy a house. They helped them. They helped them. It was government. Redlining is a government phenomenon, not a private phenomenon. We'll get to the private phenomenon in a minute. And what did the government do? Again, you should read your history rather than reading the convention rather than reading what everybody says, rather than reading the kind of socialist vision view of, of American history, read the real American history. The real discrimination, the real racism was at government agencies, government programs that segregated. So the HUD, HUD is the agency that provides insurance for mortgages. And HUD basically would not give mortgages to black people, would not insure their mortgages. Now again, white people who came in, who wanted to buy a home, could get a mortgage from a bank, not because they were white, but because the government was willing to insure the mortgage. And when the government insures the mortgage, a bank is willing to cover it. 
to this day. You can get, some banks demand that you get, mortgage insurance. That's why they can keep rates so low, because a big chunk of their risk is guaranteed by the government through this mortgage insurance. HUD refused to give mortgages to blacks. And therefore, uh, not, uh, it refused to give insurance to blacks. And therefore, banks refused to give the mortgages. It wasn't because the banks were discriminating. It wasn't because the banks were redlining. It was because, economically, you had one person with the same, from the same income, the same economic situation, one of them getting government insurance and one of them not. One of them low risk and one of them high risk. Had nothing to do with skin color, had everything to do with the fact that the government was discriminating. City ordinances were written all over the country. City ordinance, or, ordinances were written that restricted the ability of blacks to live in certain neighborhoods. They were restricted to the neighborhoods that were deemed appropriate for them. Usually, the neighborhoods are consistent with low-income housing that was typically built for them when they worked during the war. Now, you, a good book about this, by the way, about all this issue of redlining and housing and everything is called The Color of Law, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. Segregation, redlining, discrimination by business is a feature of government policy. It is a consequence of government policy. Now, I haven't read the whole book, but wow, when I read this stuff, it was unbelievable. I didn't realize, I didn't realize how, dis how much federal law and state and local law discriminated against blacks before the 1960s. Now, most of that is gone. Most of that is gone in, in its place are the reverse discrimination that favors minorities and favors, we'll get to that. But for decades, really from Reconstruction on, in the South and in, but much in the North as well, there were laws that restricted the ability of blacks to buy home, to gain certain jobs. You know, in a, there was a Ford plant, there was a, the unions held them out, there was a Ford plant in, in, uh, in, in California, on the East Bay, opposite San Francisco, and there was a big sign on that Ford plant before the war, before World War II, and it said, no black and Hispanic employees, workers, allowed. They just didn't hire them. And then when they did hire them during the war, because they had no choice, then the city segregated them in housing. So there, this segregation, this complaint about redlining, is a valid complaint about the government, and it has, as this video will illustrate, it has long-term consequences. It has real long-term consequences. But it is a mistake to attribute it to capitalism. Well, let's, let's go through this a little bit, and, and I'll tell you Some insurance why. companies use these maps for decades to deny black people loans and other services based purely on race. Now, let's think this through. Is this true? Could this be true? Or, or, or let's say it differently a little bit. Let's say this a little bit differently. What does it mean? Uh, would this happen in capitalism? Would this happen in capitalism? So imagine there's a bank run by a racist, and he refuses mortgages to blacks who could pay it back then what would happen in a capitalist economy, in a true laissez-faire economy, what would happen? Well, another bank, who is not run by a racist, would enter the space, give mortgages to all these blacks, and reap the profits, and do much better than the first bank. So competition would drive redlining away. Markets would punish the redliner. Now, let's imagine a worse world. Let's imagine, I don't know, you're in Alabama or someplace that's really racist in those days. And imagine that every bank is run by a racist. 
so that no bank will issue these loans. What would be the solution in a marketplace, in a free market to that? Well, a black man or woman would start their own bank, focus on giving blacks loans that they couldn't get anywhere else, make a killing from that, and grow their bank and drive these other bankers, compete with these other bankers. You would start your own bank. Now, leave the state is what many blacks did. So why wasn't that the solution? Why isn't it the case that other blacks stepped in to replace the bank or that blacks didn't start their own banks to compete? Why did that not happen? Why was that gap in the market not filled? Why wasn't it filled? Because of government. So blacks were not allowed to get a bank charter in the South. Banks were not allowed to get a bank charter in the South. The regulators, federal regulators, who approved bank charters, again, this is a, banks are regulated business, heavily, heavily, heavily regulated by the federal government and by state governments, would not allow them to start a bank. So even if you wanted to, you couldn't start a bank to compete against the bankers who are racists. And then, what about the non-racist banker? Well, the non-racist banker was discriminated against by the government because he couldn't get, he couldn't get insurers to insure the mortgages. And the insurer was not a private insurer. Again, this is not private markets. It was, again, a government. The problem of racism in America, the damage that racism that was done in America, is primarily the damage done by the state, by government, federal government, local governments, prohibiting starting businesses. By the way, there's a good uh, movie that illustrates some of this with regard to banks and mortgages and everything. And that's called, I think it's called The Banker. It's on Apple TV. Apple TV called The Banker, based on a true story. Fascinating and how these couple of banks managed to buy a bank in Texas and, and all, the, all the challenges that they go through in order to do that and what they, what's done to them as a consequence. They're basically sent to jail. So no, racism is primarily a consequence of government policy. And yes, this government policy, this lack of freedom, this lack of capitalism, is what has caused whatever systemic racism still exists in this country. It's government involvement in education. It's government involvement in banking. It's government involvement in mortgages. It's government involving in housing. It's government zoning. It's government. And the solution to racism is not more government programs. It's not government programs to reverse the racism with new racist programs. The solution is to reduce government's involvement. The solution is capitalism. The solution is freedom. The solution is laissez-faire. In laissez-faire, a racist business owner won't survive. In laissez-faire, a racist banker will be priced out of the market. In laissez-faire, a developer sends the house to the highest bidder. In laissez-faire, racism... It's not that like laissez-faire has an anti-racist agenda, but laissez-faire makes racism impractical. It makes racism a losing strategy. It makes racism an ideology for losers. So it's only laissez-faire capitalism that can solve the problem of racism. If you want to solve the problem of systemic racism that all these demonstrators are advocating for, the solution is more capitalism, the exact opposite of what they want. They want more state involvement, more socialism, more control, more state intervention, which is ultimately the source of this racism. Boycotts are a good solution against racism in a free market, in capitalism. Racism is impractical. 
under capitalism. But when it's the ruling ideology of those in government who are trying to run our life and trying to centrally plan, then it's a disaster. All right, let's keep watching this. So this is this whole stuff about banks, redlining banks. It's just, it's bogus without government programs. None of this would happen without government regulations, without government controls, without government basically managing the economy. None of that would have happened. Historically speaking, owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. There's truth to that. Starting a business Grandparents helps. wanted to buy a house. The banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. The banks refused because the government basically incentivized them to refuse. So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home, and because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Kevin well, here again, you know, their options for higher education were really scarce in certain domains, right? Certain colleges discriminated. That's why black colleges were founded, right? Colleges that specialized in, in accommodating black students were founded as a result of the fact that blacks were discriminated against in other colleges. And again, the solution to that has all been affirmative action, which is more than compensated for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But notice there's no nuance here at all, right? They couldn't get into college. Well, they're very limited. Well, yeah, they were limited, but they were not zero. Jews, by the way, were restricted from the best universities in the country in the early part of the 20th century. Yale and Harvard and, and the Ivy Leagues basically had a policy of not admitting Jews or admitting very few Jews. And they still managed. So they went to second-rate universities, third-rate universities, and excelled and did well. So it can't just be this, although this is a factor, and the, and the fact that universities excluded backs is evil. It's racism, and it's bad. Parents, on the other hand, got a low interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. Even now, this is true. There's a truth to this, but it's not the whole story. It's only a piece of the story, and this is primarily history. None of this is true today. Late as the 1980s, an investigation into the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. I'm skeptical about this study. I can't prove it's wrong, but I am skeptical. In, in addition, at least today, Atlanta has a number, today Atlanta has a number of minority-owned banks that specialize in providing mortgages and loans to small businesses for the black and Hispanic community in Atlanta. So I don't know about the 80s, and I wasn't there, but again, the profit motive would suggest that that would not happen, that a higher income black family would be easier to get a loan than a low income white family. Uh, so, so I would have to look at that study more carefully to figure that out. But again, remember, heavy, heavy regulations of banks. Banks are not free. And, by the 1980s, HUD was not discriminating, so mortgage insurance was as available to a white family as it was, uh, to a black family as it was to a white family. So uh, none of that would have, uh, would have existed in the 80s. So again, skepticism, I can't prove it, it, but it doesn't make sense to me. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, Black families have five dollars and four cents. I don't know if this number is true either, but it is a big gap, and and this is a consequence of historic racism. Historic racism is no question has hurt the ability of of wealth creation and then wealth transfer from generation to generation. That is just a fact of reality out there. This is particularly true in the South, but it's true in parts of the North as well. The 2017 study confirms that redlining is still affecting home values in major cities like Chicago today. This well, but that is a question of, there's no redlining in Chicago today. So there is a difference in terms of home values, but that is a multifaceted question. What are the crime rates? What is the culture? What, are the, what, what, what is going on? What is the quality of the homes in a particular, again, so 
you got to be skeptical of some of these studies, particularly when they extrapolate the history to today. There's no redlining today. You couldn't get away with that. I mean, you would you'd be sued. The, the lawsuits, the 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 um, uh, all the laws are skewed today the other way, the other way. Right. This is a good question. Tom's asked, and using in terms like black community capitulating to the idea that blacks or any racial group can can and should be discussed as a monolith is in the speaking in tribal terms. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I don't think, I don't like black community, but there is such a thing as a community. There is such a thing as people who live together and have a particular culture and live, unfortunately, I, I don't think there should be communities based on skin color, but we live in a world today in which there is such a thing. And I'll talk a little bit about culture within black communities, because I think that plays a big role in what's going on here. These black communities were created by regulation. They were created because of racist city planning and redlining by city and federal authorities. And what they've created is monolithic skin color, because I, you know, I don't believe in race, but people do have different skin color, uh, people living together. Then, if you add to that what I've talked about before, which is the war on poverty, welfare, minimum wage, licensing law, and everything else that has held many of these people back. And I want to talk in a minute about culture and leadership, which I think has held these people back. But, but yes, in a healthy society, in a laissez-faire society, people would not be clustered around communities, community just physical spaces, with people of the same ethnic background or the same skin color for very long. Immigrants tend to cluster together for familiarity's sake. And then within a couple of generations, they spread out and that goes away. Blacks have been in this country for a long time. There should be no black communities. There should be no white communities. There should just be communities. The fact that there is racism here and its origins and its source can, we are discussing is why Blacks live together and whites live together. White neighborhoods and black neighborhoods, those exist. It's a sad fact of the world that those exist. They shouldn't exist. We should strive and should have always strived for a colorblind society, which is what Martin Luther King argued for. But we don't and we haven't for a long, long time. All right. So... How Kevin and Jamal inherited vastly different circumstances. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. A big part of systemic racism is implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. So this is interesting. So these are subconscious prejudices that you have that you don't even know that you have, right? And and I think a lot of people do have these. Um, and I think a lot of people are not very conscious. They're not thinkers. I think a lot of racism is a consequence of evasion, of not thinking, of, of lazy, intellectual laziness, and of not checking your own implicit biases. These could be real. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university, the same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's. And that's not because of his name. And that's not because of the color of his skin, because indeed affirmative action. So let me tell you a story. So I was, um, I, I, my, first, my first university job, I was, uh, was going to be hired. Um, I, I had an interview, a really good interview at Santa Clara University. And uh, they said, oh, we want to give you an offer. We're going to give you an offer. Don't worry, you're going to get an offer. I said, okay. I wait a few weeks and no offer comes. So I call them up and I say, hey, what's going on? I thought I was going to get an offer. And I said, look, there's this black female on the market. And, you know, the university is forcing us to make her an offer, you know, because she's black and she's female. And you're a white guy, you know, we have to do this. And then they said, don't worry. She's getting an offer from every university. She's not going to accept our offer. So you'll be next, <laughs> which was true. She got offers from many universities. She took another more lucrative position at this university. And ultimately, after a number of other um, speed bumps on the road, 
uh, where I was told I, I, I wasn't getting the job because there were too many Jews in the finance department, so where the university exhibited anti-Semitic traits, I was finally offered the job and took it. But there's affirmative action today. So the chances are that if you're black from a good university, you're probably getting more offers. You're probably getting more interviews. By the way, Santa Clara University is a Catholic university, very leftist, super ultra leftist, Catholic university. So I don't buy this. I don't buy this. I mean, part of the reasons why his resume is not as good, because Kevin went to a good school. Kevin probably did a lot of uh, community service and did a lot of bullshit stuff to make his resume look good. And Jamal probably didn't. But if graduated they're identical from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white sounding names get twice as many callbacks as identical resumes with black sounding names. Again, I'm skeptical, can't prove it, skeptical. But you know, I, I, I'm the first, I, I'm one of the first people to say that racism exists in America. And we'll talk about why maybe it's even on the rise in a little while when I finish this video. But racism does exist in America. Americans are much more racist than I ever thought they were. Much more racist. And you can see that, that one of the m biggest areas you can see that is in immigration. But uh, it, it, it's true beyond that as well. Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment. Really? Maybe the black unemployment rate is higher because of what you said about education earlier? Why is it because of implicit bias? There's no evidence of this, I don't believe. Or if there is evidence, it's, it's, it's very shaky ground. It's much more likely to be an issue of the education that, you, that they talked about earlier than about this. College graduates today. You can see evidence of systemic racism in every area of life. The disparities in family wealth, incarceration rates, political representation. Incarceration rates? No, probably not. A lot of that has to do with the fact that the black blacks uh, have embraced the drug trade as, as, a, as a way to make money in, in many of these communities. And uh, a, a lot of them, you know, are incarcerated for drug offenses. Uh, crime rates in, um, in drugs. It's not incarceration where you see higher rates. You see it in crime. Blacks commit more crime. Blacks are more likely to commit crime. So all of those are just realities that are reflected in incarceration rates as a consequence. Representation, I'm not even sure, in education. I mean, yeah, I mean, all of this is, again, there's elements of truth. This is the complexity. Elements of truth couched in a lot of lies or a lot of misrepresentation. And education are all examples of systemic racism. No, Unfortunately, the biggest challenge with systemic racism is that there's no single person or entity responsible for it, which makes it very hard to solve. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is work towards becoming more aware of your own implicit biases. I agree with that. I think people do have implicit biases. I think the more aware you are of, 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 of the content of your subconscious or what your subconscious feeds you, of, of the kind of ideas you have about other people and how you respond to different people, I think that's helpful. I think work on this, particularly with cops, is very, very helpful and part of the educational program should be around these things if it's done rationally and properly. Which, again, is a big if. <laughs> a big if. What are some prejudices that you might hold that you're not aware of? Second, let's acknowledge that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws are still affecting access to opportunity today. As a result, true. we should support systemic changes that create more equal opportunity. So reform criminal justice system, I'm all for that. I'm for more than just reforming the criminal justice system. I'm for doing away with drug law, uh, you know, getting rid of the drug wars, uh, getting rid of, of the whole thing, legalizing everything, everything, heroin, cocaine, every single drug out there, legalize it, or at least decriminalize it. Get people out of jail who commit victimless crimes. I'm for doing away with most of the laws or, or, or eliminating the war on immigration, on immigrants. I'm for real reform of the criminal justice system. Real reform. Reform the laws. Reform the laws. And, and, and again, that would change the dynamics completely. It would reduce the number of police we need. 
it would make it easier to find good policemen. It would reduce the amount of violence in society. It would reduce the amount of corruption within the police force. It would change everything. And predatory lending. I, there is no such thing as predatory lending. That is such a BS leftist term. There is no such thing as predatory lending. You know, there's high interest rate lending because of the risk that people take, the risk that people constitute, but it's not predatory. Predatory lending is the mafia. Predatory lending is, uh, what do you call the, the guy at the corner who's lending money? Um, I forget, right? But predatory lending, actual stores, pawn shops, uh, 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 paycheck lending, they're the ones that eliminate the real predatory lending, which are the loan sharks. The loan sharks who break your legs if you don't pay them back. They're the predatory lenders. And paycheck lending is the antidote to that. Protect voting rights. I agree. We should protect voting rights. For everyone. Increasing public school funding and making it independent from... How about privatizing? Privatizing schools. Access that would be, be a ideal. great start. So that poor and wealthy districts can receive equal access to resources. Places that have done that have not shown a significant difference. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Luckily, we're all part of the system, which means that we all have a role to play. All right. That's, uh, that's the end of it. Um, yes, systemic problems require systemic solutions, and I agree with that. And the best systemic solution to systemic racism, to the extent that it exists, is capitalism. It's freedom. It's laissez-faire. It's getting rid of state intervention, government controls, government redlining, government decisions, government affirmative action. Thank you, Alex. That's very generous. And what this video ignores is that the black communities, or blacks as individuals, have had lousy leadership, lousy intellectuals, and a lousy commitment to religion. The leaders have advocated for welfare programs, for redistribution of wealth, for handouts, for give me's, rather than for jobs, for work, for wealth creation. Their leaders have been anti-capitalist when capitalism is the only legitimate long-term solution to racism. Their intellectuals have been Marxist, leftists, anti-capitalist, anti-Americans. With the exception of people like Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams and a few others. They've been committed to an economic system and a political system that hurts the black individual, the ambitious person who wants to be successful, is hurt by them. And of course, they're committed to religion. They're way too religious, way too committed to sacrifice. Not ambitious enough. And this brings me to the fact that this leadership and these intellectuals, you know, Martin Luther King was much better than these leaders and these intellectuals. But many of the people surrounding Martin Luther King, many of the people who are hailed as, as civil rights leaders, and suddenly many of the people today who act as their leaders are thoroughly corrupt, thoroughly leftist, thoroughly anti-American, thoroughly anti-capitalist. And the consequence of this, the consequence of ideas, the consequence of leadership, the consequence of intellectual, of, of um, ideas, leadership, intellectuals, of lack of education or lousy education, is a negative bad culture. And unfortunately, these communities have bad culture. And they're not the only communities that have bad culture. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, white trash. That, that, that has bad culture. There's a lot of communities of other colors, skin, that have bad cultures. But this is very prevalent among blacks. A entitlement mentality, which the welfare state has ingrained in them. A lack of enough appreciation of the value of education, 
Again, this is a generalization. There are many, 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 many exceptions, and I salute the exceptions. They're heroic, the exceptions, because they have to overcome their leaders, their intellectuals, and the culture in which they live. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time, so I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourronbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, Show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...